Most of the, the people that suffer immeasurably from these issues are deficient in usually B12, some of the other B vitamins. D. D and yeah, vitamin D. So if you're eating a species appropriate diet, right? And if you think veganism is that, then eat that, but it's not. Eat mainly animal based, ruminant animals, because they are the ones that don't take on a lot of the, the omega-6 and the soya bean crap that are fed to pigs and chickens. And I don't want to get too technical on people here, but like, do that. And you won't have to worry about any of this stuff. What it is, Brad Lee back again with another episode of Dropping Bombs today in the studio, folks. As always, I've got a real treat for you. Laban Ditchburn in the house. What's up, Laban? I graciously receive and accept that wonderful introduction, Brad Lee. Thank you very much. It's You're welcome. And Laban Ditchburn. That sounds like a movie star's name. It will be one day. What? Where's Laban come from? That's close to labia. Well, don't get lippy, Brad. <laughs> Good one. It's, uh, it's an hey, old, that's quick. <laughs> it's an old Bible, Old Testament Bible name. It's Is like it? third book and it goes Genesis something, something. And it's in that one. And he was, uh, he wasn't that great a dude in the Bible. What was his he, name? Laban. <laughs> but he, he, uh, it means white. It glorious. wasn't Laban Ditchburn, was it? No, that came later. That's, Ditch, Ditchburn that, sounds like a freaking, like a. Like the whole name together sounds the movie star, like Laban Ditchburn. Well, Ditchburn is from the, the Battle of the Bannock Burn in Scotland from are, a few hundred years ago. Are you Scottish? We got history, English, French, Scottish. Because you're Australian originally. Half, ki half Kiwi, which is New Zealand, New Zealand, bro, Kakitiana, and half Australian. Mum's a New Zealander, dad's an Aussie. Where'd you grow up? Half my life in New Zealand, the other half in Australia. Which in the do you last. prefer? Neither. <laughs> but I hear New Zealand's like got some deadly creatures everywhere, and it's, it's you know it's beautiful, but it's not like ideal to live in. So the only dangerous creatures in New Zealand are the hobbits. What are those? From Lord of the Rings. There's nothing dangerous in New Zealand apart from former prime ministers and a few government officials. If you get my meaning. Yeah, but no. Deadly spiders. Nothing. I know there's there's deadly shit in Australia. Australia is a completely different kill of fish. But New Zealand, yeah, it's nothing. It, I don't think anything can kill you there. Oh, really? I think so. I, I yeah. heard the opposite, but okay. There's I no want to go there now. no poison snakes or anything. I hear it's wonderful then. Tyranny is prevalent in yeah. New Zealand. That it is. During the COVID nonsense, they locked that shit down tighter than a nun. It's a bad habit. Another quick one. See, this guy's quick on it. You didn't tell me that. So, so folks, if you guys are wondering, who is this dude? Well, number one, you can find him on social media at labanditchburn.inc. I-N-C. Laban Ditchburn. Is it labanditchburn.inc? Yeah. No, no, no. That's the, uh, it's my TikTok. It's my Instagram. That's social media. Yeah. But it's not the same everywhere, unfortunately. There's a link tree. Which is probably easier. Well, most people, when I say social media, they're going to go to Instagram or Facebook or Twitter. If you punch Laban Ditchburn into the internet, there's only one combination of that name anywhere on planet Earth. That's nice. You'll find them. So in other words, Google me, bitch. Google me, bitch. I have a shirt that says Google me, bitch. Google me, ditch. Burn. Yeah, LabanDitchburn.inc. You'll find him. Or you can go to PodcastingHeroes.com. He's also got a book out called Bet On You. Ultimately, you grew up kind of uh, affected by dis divorce, dysfunction. You had a kind of shitty childhood, back and forth, thrown around, and you ended up okay anyway. Then I want to get to where you are now, where now you're like a big podcaster. By the way, your podcast, you have a podcast. I do, yeah. It's called Courage. Become Coach. Your Own Superhero Podcast. Become Your Own Superhero. Become Your Own Superhero Podcast. How many episodes you got? 200 plus 200 plus and you got big name people on there how do you get those big name people on there that's a great question you've all, you're all, you're also sending me a lot of those big names to, to be on here well it started early doors and it, the podcast was created out of the lockdown so we were living back in melbourne australia at that time and eight episodes deep a cold called les brown and he picked up the phone and i was in bed on a saturday morning 
in a cold Mel- Melbourne morning next to my wife and I was butt naked because I always sleep nude anyway. And he picked up the phone and I was so shocked that he picked up because I had his cell phone. I jumped out of bed and terrified a bunch of the construction workers who were working next door. And with that big, beautiful chocolate velvet voice, he said, hi, Les speaking. I said, Les Brown? He said, yes, it is. I said, Les Brown, it's Laban Ditchman from Melbourne, Australia. I always love to have a geographical reference, right? He said, well, how can I help you, Laban? I said, Les, I'm a huge fan of you and your work, and I'm also the host of an amazing podcast series called Become Your Own Superhero. And I'd be honored if you came and shared your amazing story with our audience. When are you available? Close. He said, well, when are you thinking, boy? And I said, to be honest, Les, whenever you're available probably works with me. So he came on about three days later. And before we even started the interview, I said to him, and for those who don't know Les Brown, like get on YouTube after this and just L-E-S Brown. It'll make your day a hundred times better if you're having a shitty day and it'll make it even better if it's good. Everybody knows Les, no? But you'd be amazed who don't, right? And everyone, everyone should have some Les Brown in their life. But so I said, hey, Les, what do you think of the name of the, the podcast? More, hey, more or less? More or less. Less is more. And if for anyone that's heard Les speak, he just absolutely beautifully crushed his response. And I was so moved by his his response to me that I just verbally diarrheaed this story of transformation that I'd gone through and conquering the drink and the drugs and the gambling and the flandering and the limiting beliefs and the negative self-talk and the autoimmune and the, all the other stuff. And something that I said really resonated with him because he goes, congratulations, Laban. Like he listened just like there was no one else around, which there wasn't, but that's charisma for you. And I said, thanks, Les. He goes, do you have a book? And I go, no. He goes, if you're going to be a speaker, you need a book to help with your credibility. And I was like, okay. He goes, who was the most influential person in your life when you were five? I'd never thought of this question before, Brad. And I was like, holy shit. Despite her many, 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 many flaws that have been my mum, who I had a very unhealthy relationship with that time. And he said, well, what attributes did you get from your mum? And I was like, man, she was like unconditionally loving and spiritual and tenacious. And he's writing this stuff down, Brad. And he finishes writing. He looks up at me and he goes, Laban, this is a God moment. He says, I'm going to show you how to monetize your purpose. I swear to God this happened. And I captured this on Zoom video, by the way. He read back to me the blueprint for this book that he wants me to write called Bet On You because I used to be a degenerate, degenerate gambler and a degenerate. He said, you're Laban, you're going to write the book. You're going to turn the book into a keynote. You're going to turn the keynote into a three-day retreat. And even if you fuck this up, you're going to make multiple six figures in the next 12 months. And Laban, I'm going to interview you on my social media platform with 4 million followers. And I'm going to write the forward to your book. In a moment of complete and utter insanity, I said to Les, and now this is mid-May 2020. I said, Les, if you're going to write the forward to my book, I'll have it to you by June 30. Now, for context, I never finished high school, never went to college, never wrote anything of any significance in my life before. And a divine download, I wrote the first draft, 30,000 words, delivered it to his inbox as promised, 8.30 p.m. on June 30, and completely changed my shit in the process. And what happened was the, the confidence and the momentum that I generated from that experience propelled me forward into becoming absolutely fearless when it came to reaching out and connecting with incredible A-list guests. And, and I realized that I could serve at the highest levels because of the value that I was able to bring to the party because I was reaching out and connecting with these people in the same way I connected with you with what value can I add these people's lives rather than what can I get from them. And people pick up on that energy. It's completely different to go, what, what does this guy want? They're like, what is this guy all about? And it just got to the point where I, I was given some great advice, like, Laban, you need to teach people how to do this. People that, that have a voice, that are umming and ahhing about a podcast because their, their subject matter is a little bit on the, you know, the non-mainstream or whatever. If you've been given a gift from the universe, and I absolutely know that I have, I have an obligation to be successful in this in this arena. And when you understand the value that you have and that you can impact in, in these other people's lives, that's when the magic happens. We did the podcast, Les and I, and at the end of it, I said, Les, what do you need help with? And he said, well, what do you have in mind? 
for those who don't know, Les has had prostate cancer twice and he's been following doctor's orders and he's been able to beat it eventually, but they put him on drugs that took all the testosterone out of his body and he stacked on 100 pounds and developed type 2 diabetes. And I said, well, Les, and I read about this in his book, and I said, Les, I lost 60 pounds of body fat and put on 30 pounds of muscle. Would you like to know more about that? He said, send me everything you got. So I sent him all this information. So there was that was me able to add some value to his life. And then seven months later, I was having a conversation with a guy, Dr. Chris Kenobi, who's a former ophthalmologist, like eye surgeon. And I was telling him the story that I've just told you guys. And he said, would you send me the video? And this, this guy's been working with Joe McCullough and like, this guy's a real deal, right? Excuse the pun. And he watched this video and he sent me this huge email the next day basically saying, Laban, I want to help Wes Brown. And I, like a month later, I had this incredible three-way Zoom call with Les Brown, Dr. Chris Kenobi and myself. And, and Chris was able to share all this amazing insights around seed oils and, and all this other stuff. And Les Which is, are bad or good? It was that seed oil, veg, like seed oil, omega six linoleic acid, processed hexane, like soybean, rice bran, safflower, like garbage. Get them out of your diet immediately. And it's crazy. It's, I don't want to go on a different direction, but I keep hearing about seed oils being terrible, but they're in everything. If you look at the ingredients, they're always seed oils. And it's like when you say get them out of your diet, well, what are we going to be able to eat eventually? Cucumbers, meat, just meat, ruminant animals, ruminant, yeah, beef and lamb, and there's there's a number of alternatives. Well, I'm I'm on the right track. I'm ninety percent there because nowadays is pretty much steak, hamburger. I love hamburgers, but, but and not with the bun. I just lettuce, tomato, mustard, ketchup, pickles. Boom! Between two things of lettuce, dude, it's just as good. Well, so that, I'm on the way, but keep going with that story because I don't want to interrupt that story. Well, it's it nearly finished, but basically what's happened is two things. Les was able to see the power of this value add. Chris Kenobi offered to fly to Atlanta. Is that Obi-Wan's brother? No relation. Oh. Spelt K-N-O-B-B-E. Oh. But Les has lost the weight. Yes, he has, or, or right. at some point at this time. You're La- talking about? Later on, later on, with the co- like, I'm not, I'm not attributing exactly what I did or what Chris did to Les's success, but it resulted in a, a really wonderful friendship that's developed. And, and Anna and I were invited to his home last year in Atlanta, and we had this incredible moment where we just we broke bread or broke steak. And did anybody cry? He did, because. I knew someone had to. Have. We were asking him. I think Anna might have cried a little bit too because his. This is very public information. His youngest son. He's got ten kids: five boys, five girls. Formerly married to Gladys Knight. For those that are curious, right? Less or his son? No, less. Less. Well, say, but his yeah. son has struggled with mental health and drug addiction, and he opened up in that conversation. And because it's public domain, I don't mind sharing this. And he he was weeping, and then there was this amazing moment where Anna came and embraced him, and like the seventy seven year old you know, icon of, of transformational speaking. And now he's my buddy just because I had some dino balls and, and cold called a guy to see what he needed help with in some kind of backward way. And, and Brad, what's happened, dude, is this shit has just been snowballing, right? I've been given a million dollars. I worked this out when I was creating this course, a million dollars plus of free things in terms of introductions free masterminds, courses, just mentoring, incredible stuff. And I'm not a famous person in Australia at all. My my YouTube at time of recording has probably got 1,300 subs. The podcast gets a few more listens. It's like, who the fuck is this guy? Well, I believe I'm the world's best courage coach, motherfucker. And how would the world's best courage coach conduct himself? He's got to lead by example. That's what he's got to do. Well, do you believe that most people are afraid to, you know, like you said, dino balls to reach out? Like, dude, call me weird, but like, to me, that's like, that's not dino balls. I'll reach out to anybody. Give me their fucking phone number. Tell me someone I won't call. I'll shit. Give me their phone number. (laughs) The key is you have their phone number. Because my question would be, well, what's his number? Because like, you give me anybody's phone number, I'll call them. 
I'll call them. I have no fear whatsoever to reach out. Are you saying that most people do? I'm saying everyone but you and me and a handful of people don't have the courage to do it. Isn't that crazy? It's crazy. Because, dude, after doing it, I mean, like, you weren't nervous when you did it. You just did it. Were you nervous? Not really. Because, I mean, what's the worst that can happen? That's why I always ask myself, what's the worst that can happen? Well, the worst that can happen, not not from less, but I've been abused verbally, but, like, three or four times out of, like, 500. And I called Princess Beatrice, by the way. Who's that? Princess Beatrice, like. Prince Andrew's daughter. See, again, I don't know the royal family. Who's like, Prince Andrew? Like, he's the guy that was caught up with Epstein. I thought there was Prince Charles. Well, he's probably involved with And Epstein. now it's King Charles, isn't it? Yeah. Dude, isn't that crazy? That's the, another thing I don't get. The royal families. Like, all those people are going to say that these people are the ones that get to decide everything. And, and when they're born, it's like, okay, it's never going to be none of you. Unless you're a, a descendant and born into this family. How about blow me? <laughs> <laughs> but you guys, you guys kicked their ass in the war. So you've never had, like we were, we were British colonies. You know, we just spent three months in, in India, which was a British col- colony up until recently. And that's our. But that's why you know all these princes and princesses, because you're, you're part of that deal. The, the point of sharing Princess Beatrice, right? And was. Do you have a phone number? Yeah. Give it to me. I'll call her right now. I princess Beatrice. I'll call the princess. Be like, dude, you're really. A- no, I won't mess with her. Because she'll say, where'd she you get your number? Me. And I got to tell the truth. I'll be like fucking lame. And give it to me. <laughs> she, now, full disclosure, that phone call lasted less than 15 seconds. Right? Oh, she's one of the ones that yelled at you? No, she didn't yell at me. But there's that. There's a there's a, um, a feeling that I pick up on. Like, how the fuck did he get this phone number? I'll tell you. This is a free one, Right. There's a program called Lusha.com, L-U-S-H-A.com, and it's a plug-in over Chrome, and it works best over LinkedIn. That's where I've gotten all these phone numbers and email addresses from incredible people, politicians like Albert Baller, like that's the guy from Pfizer. Like, from where? Pfizer. Pfizer. <laughs> Is he one of the good ones from Pfizer or no? Because no. you know there was a one that quit, and now he's out there ringing the bell. The 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 I I say that's a good one. He's, he's a good one. He's yeah, telling the truth. Fire, Albert's not. He's evil. Is he the one that you saw in the interview where they're like, you know, hey, how come you're doing that? And he was like dodging the questions. He's he's been all over everything. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to go down that rail hole too much. But if we do, the the episode will get suppressed. Well, we don't want it suppressed. We, we want, want it to suppress. reach millions, not hundreds. Billions. Dude, when I had Rashad or Rashid, her name, people say Rashid, but his name is Rashid. Dr. Rashid Batar. When I had him on here, dude, I got more views on YouTube than any other video ever. And then they deleted it. I put up my dropping bombs. They freaking deleted it. Like, dude, they didn't want that guy talking to anybody. And he said a couple of weeks ago, a month ago, I forget how long ago it was, but it's recent that, uh, you know, he felt like, you know, you know, there's a group that's kind of threatening him or saying they're after him. And now he's dead. Rest in peace, my man. All right. Rashid. Yeah. You know, Rashid. Was I, he on I never your show? Met him. I, I'd seen his stuff, never met him, but I know plenty of people that know him very, very well. Yeah. They say he might have been poisoned. Yeah. Can you imagine, though? But that means there's people that are above the law in this in this world, like literally above the law. And I, and I would say that the royal family is one of them. Well, I mean, I, I got a good feeling about the future, Brad. I think that, that we're in for a real shift. And I think people are getting sick and tired of putting up with this bullshit. And Some of it do, but listen, if you're in control, you're in control. But when have people always had control forever in history? Never. Not forever. Never, ever. Not forever. Forever, ever? I, I agree with that. Not forever. But, but my point is, is like, you know, Right now, social media is, is pretty much how you get words out, okay? It's either the television or the social media. That's it. You know, newspaper, media, it's all the same thing to me. Well, if the left, for lack of better words, controls those outlets, well, then the left has the voice. And if you're a very popular individual and they really want to shut you down, they will. Like, like Donald Trump, dude, they shut his ass up. I never hear from Donald Trump anymore. Do you? Well, I don't use Truth Social. 
I'm just saying, but nobody really hears from him much. Why? Because the left, who who controls the media, shut his ass up. So it doesn't matter what he says because not many people are going to hear it. So when you say, you know, things are going to shift, how? Did, did we did we build our own networks? Did we? Yeah, there's, I, you know, we've mentioned Jordan Peterson before uh, off camera. And as far as I know, he's building his own social media network or platform. With, I'd with say some more other like a university, but yeah. Yeah, but there'll be more of these things come into place because you can't just shut people up forever. Like, like I said to you when we when we met, like I just want to know the truth so I can make an informed decision. Like I don't, I don't give a shit. I just want to know the truth. And when you take that away from me, like, then my skepticism has come from uh, seventeen years of being lied to about this incurable autoimmune disease that I had that I fixed in four days watching a Joe Rogan podcast with a functional medicine doctor, a guy, Dr. Chris Cresser, who was talking about the link between gluten intolerance and reflux heartburn. I was like, surely it can't be that simple. What was it? Well, good. Gastrointestinal reflux disorder. So it's chronic heartburn. So basically anything I ate. Now bear in mind, I was 60 pounds heavier than I am now. And I was drinking a million frothies a week. What's frothies, beer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very Australian term. Um, smoking a thousand darts. Like <laughs> what, are, what are darts? Cigarettes, cigarettes or joints? Yeah, lung darts. And uh, doing gear on the weekend. Which I thought those drugs. were called fags. Um, you can call them fags. It's more of a British colloquial term, I think. Oh. I am smoking a fag. That's that's how you would use it in that context. But I like I like darts better. Yeah, and and like no, hey you fat bastard, knock the frothies on the head and maybe your health will improve. And uh, as soon as I cut the refined grains and bread and stuff out of my diet, gone. And I was like, completely. What? Else? what? Yeah. What else are these motherfuckers wrong about? Yeah, because my daughter right now she's eight. Dude, she'll all of a sudden just, you know, start going, uh, and I don't know, is it heartburn? What is she feeling? But apparently something wrong with her stomach. And and I said, from now on, let's track what she's eating because it's it's always like she's happy, she's playing, then all of a sudden she's got a stomach ache so bad she has to cry about it. And I started tracking what she's eating, and every time her stomach hurts, she ate some sort of bread, some Bingo. sort of bullshit. So I said, well, you might be like gluten intolerant or something. Celiac. So what do you think we need to do for her? Just keep out the bread? I, well, if you showed me that food diary, I could tell you in about 10 seconds the, the likely protagonist. And I'm not even a, a medical thing, but I've spent like thousands of hours researching this because the idiots that are the doctors, and not all of them, but most of them have just been indoctrinated. Yeah, they've been told what, they were, what somebody wanted them to know. Yeah, and I, I've gotten to a point now where I tell my GP what to do. Without coming across as a complete dick, like that, they, they don't know. They don't know. They don't understand. How can I eat only meat for three and a half years and have perfect cholesterol? Is that how you? It's been for you. So I've been able to reintroduce um, a few more, usually fruits and stuff, but grains, no good, no good. Like whenever I eat that stuff, it, it really negatively impacts me. But for three and a half years, I ate. 99% of what I ate was animal-based, mainly red meat. So no raisins. <laughs> no raisins. I was raising hell. No almonds. No. No sunflower seeds. No. No pumpkin seeds. No. No nuts. No nuts. No, I didn't have any fruit for, for, for three and a half years. Well, no. but, you, but you're, you were able to. You just didn't know it. Well, whenever I would do it, it would cause massive issues. So you'd have heartburn again. Well, not not so much that, but like back pain and like joint pain and all kinds of what stuff. What about fasting? So I'm a big proponent of fasting, and and Anna, my beautiful wife, has experimented with. Well, we've both done dry fasting, which is nil by mouth, right? She's done a 95 hour dry fast. Is that what dry fasting is? Nothing goes in your mouth, not even water. Yeah, that's not a hard dry fast when you don't even touch water. So water Never fast, heard of that, but water a dry, fast. I've heard of dry fasting. I was wondering what that, what, I wonder what that is. Like you don't drink. No. And, and you don't the, touch water. Correct. Why? Why? Well, how's water well, touching you going to bother you? Well, the, because the, the more rigid and disciplined you are, the more effective it is. So there's, there's an incredible book that's written by a Russian guy, uh, which was translated into English because the Russians have been doing this forever. My wife's Russian. Right. And, and I learned about this through just my, Privyet. 
Как дела? Хорошо? До свидания. Точно. Definitely. Um, and we've been using this, this dry fasting to try and make a baby, right? Because we told you about 18 miscarriages and three of those are ectopics. We had another one just three months ago. And Anna's uterine wall had been damaged by an illegal abortion that happened when she was 15. And the uterine wall was only two, two millimeters thick. She got a scan before the dry fast, this 95-hour dry fast, and another one after. And it was 13, 14 millimeters thick. It fucking grew back. And it makes sense from a stem cell point of view. Human growth hormone goes through the roof. The body consumes all the broken and folded cells. And you feel like fucking Iron Man. Like you, you don't want to do a lot. You don't want to work a job while you're dry fasting because you just need to walk and be in nature ideally and be around fresh air and stuff. And you just don't eat. That's, that's the key. Or drink, yeah. Don't eat or drink. I mean, I could do that. I could do pretty much anything for 24 hours. Well, you do it for eight anyway when you're asleep. Yeah, so one of the one of the hacks to that someone told me was to start like at noon. That way, you know, you're only really up, you know, 10 hours. You're only fasting for 10 hours till you go to bed. Then the the eight that you're sleeping is like a cheat code. Then all you got to do is struggle for four more when you wake up. If you I ask people this question a lot. All right, how long do you think you can live with that food or water? Most people say food or water? Yeah, yeah, both. Well, I was told food 2 weeks, water 3 days. So it's all bullshit. Like this, we're, we're likely going to head to Montenegro in Europe uh, maybe later this year, early next year to do an, a supervised extended 12-day fast, dry fast. How long can you survive without water? This will be the mainstream answer, by the way. No one can live more than five to six days without water. A hogwash. That's what it says. Hogwash. Hornswoggle. You- You know why you know why that that comes with that result comes up because dry fasting Bradley was one of the things that they used for Chernobyl for all the radiation affected people they used dry fasting to help kill It's called starvation isn't it Well if you've got toxic load all over you this is what they use to help people survive from it You can don't take my word for it go and check this out peeps This is, this shit's crazy heals all kinds of incredible stuff Dude, it makes people like that have cancer go, all I got to do is just dry fast for a week and my cancer goes away. A little bit more complicated than that. If you've had chemotherapy, you're basically fucked if you're trying to do dry fasting is the general rule. Excuse you, the French. You know, there's a guy that's sitting in jail because he took apricot seeds, which which contain B17 basically, which you can't buy in the United States. Um, I know one guy. He took apricot seeds and basically cured his cancer that they said was not curable and he started telling people that and he went to prison because he's telling people that he that he cured his cancer now if you research it all the people that are trying to debunk that says no it's not what he was doing he was selling apricot seeds as a cure for cancer that's why he's in prison well because apricot seeds cured his cancer So that's what he was he was supposedly selling apricot seeds saying it cured my cancer. So he's in prison. Now a lot of people that aren't thinking will hear, well no shit because the guy's a scam. The guy's a fraud. You, there's no cure to cancer. You think everybody just wants us to die of cancer? Nobody wants to cure it? Like who are these people that think this way? Yes, it's quite likely. These big pharmaceutical companies, they have chemo and cancer medicines. They do not want us healthy. They would be out of business. So that's what I want everyone to think about. Like guys, it, it, it's not called um like the like the the medical society. They're taught whatever they were taught. They they believe in it because they were taught that. But who started the teaching? Do you know? Do you remember back in the day? Have you researched it? Some of it, yeah. Rockefeller because it was petroleum based. Bingo. And so it was more ways to be hooked on petroleum. So I mean I'm telling you if you guys search these things out it's not not conspiracy shit it makes perfect sense once you look at it and then it's like well wait a minute that means all of the shit that they're putting in our food that other countries just don't even allow right so the US allows a lot of shit that other countries they don't even allow it what why are they doing that well it's i believe 
So we need the medicines and the bullshit off the pharmacy shelf. And that's who's running the country, if you ask me. It's the pharmacies, pharmaceutical businesses. Well, it, yeah, it's beyond obvious now, isn't it? And Montesanto, it, and or what is it called? Monsanto. Monsanto. Yeah, yeah. glyphosate. Glyphosate Criminal. and Roundup, which is the same thing, is one of the key contributing factors to a number of pro- problems. And a lady that I interviewed, Dr. Stephanie Seneff, that video was deleted off, off YouTube, by the way, but you can see it on uh, Rumble. She was talking about the link between uh, glyphosate and autism in children. And it used to be like one in 10,000 children were born on the spectrum. I think it's on track to be like one in two children by the end of this decade, right? And I asked her to explain what was happening to the, and she's got, she's a PhD from MIT. She's got four degrees from MIT, right? She's a smart cookie. And she was talking about when babies are born in North America, probably Australia, Canada, England, that type of thing, there's a, there's an antibiotic schedule that they are allowed to have up to 24 doses of antibiotics. A lot of babies these days are born through C-section. They're always encouraged to come through the, the sunroof, right? Why? <laughs> and, and, uh, and what happens is the, the babies don't get access to the, the flora and fauna from the, the vaginal cavity, right? And, so the, and then they, there's something goes wrong, so they get given some antibiotics. Then they get given their childhood vaccine schedule, which doesn't even include the new stuff, right? And they develop these spectrum disorders, and she said to me off camera, right? And maybe you can delete this out. She said, at we won't, best, we won't. At best, vaccines, not even including the new mRNA, right? At best, vaccines have done nothing. At worst, they're responsible for more death and destruction than you can possibly imagine. And you might listen to me going, well, but, but, you're but, off your head, mate. Yeah, well, how do you explain polio? So if you if you look if you really dive deep into this and there's a book called turtles all the way down which people should read it's very technical but it explains this far better than me i've just absorbed this through reading and researching and interviewing a lot of these people and i love to prepare for it but a lot of these these issues that were happening the actual diseases were diminishing and then the vaccine was created and, and implemented and then caused all the damage so I would I've I've had all of my shots, bar the new ones, give or take, typhus and pol, you know pol, everything like that. But I developed bacterial meningitis, which has a forty percent mortality rate in the first twenty four hours after getting my measles, mumps, rubella shot when I was four years of age. Now I don't have evidence to link the two together, but it's a hell of a coincidence, don't you think, Bradley? Yeah, yeah. But I, I am one of those also that got all my shots when I was a kid. Um, boosters even. I remember they would leave us damn freaking, it would hurt. But, but we, everybody had to get their shots to go to school. So, so I think my first, all my kids, except for the last one, got shots. None of them uh, forcefully. In other words, like. Yeah, voluntary. Yeah. But, but. My wife, you know, the baby, the doctor tells you to get the shots need, the baby needs these shots. And so they got them shots. But a couple of years ago, I said, no more. And now we have one. We're not going to give her any shots. I just hope she doesn't get polio or some shit. Cause then we are dumb asses sitting there thinking that they're bad, you know, will end up hurting her. The, the thing that will look again, don't take anything I say as gospel. Anyone listening, go and do your own digging outside of the mainstream places, right? You're not going to find the stuff on Google. Dig deeper, right? Don't be lazy. Most of the the people that suffer immeasurably from these issues are deficient in usually B12, some of the other B vitamins. D? And yeah, vitamin D, all right? So if you're eating a species-appropriate diet, right? And if you think veganism is that, then eat that, but it's not. Eat mainly animal-based, Right, ruminant animals because they are the ones that don't take on a lot of the the omega six and the soya bean crap that are fed to pigs and chickens, which do store it in their fat. Whereas ruminants like beef and lamb and and goat, mutton they call it in India, uh, chelate a lot of that crap through their multi stomach system. And I don't want to get too technical on people here, but like, do that. And you won't have to worry about any of this stuff. Just eat ruminant animals. 
Yeah. Now like, there's going to be vegans all over the planet going bullshit because here's some studies and here's some studies. What do you say to those guys? Like, you know, there's a study and this is a fact you should, I, I forget the movie, but there's a movie you should watch, but game changes. I don't remember. I, I forget what it was called, but ultimately it showed that in whatever year the Germans came into a town took over the town, took all their cattle, all their food, all their dairy, and for the soldiers. They stayed there for four years. The only thing that the local people were allowed to eat, basically, was the vegetables. The, the, the chicken eggs, the eggs, the chicken, the beef, all that was for the government. Um, during that four years, their cancer dropped dramatically. So then the troops left and they got their animals back. And as soon as the animals were back, boom, the cancer came back. The cancer levels rose. So how do you explain that? So this is this is a publicly available information that people can find out, right? Okay. Veganism in the West was really predicated by the Seventh-day Adventist movement in the mid-1800s. And a lady by the name of Ellen G. White and her husband founded this religious organization. And Seventh-day Adventists don't eat really, the strict ones don't eat any any animal products at all. And they did that in the early days. They removed the red meat out of the diet of the men to stop the men masturbating and, and to quell their sex drive. Now, Ellen G. White was famous for having these visions, like five or 6,000 of them. A lot of them were documented. And she had this vision about the ideal diet for their, for their religion, right? It was a subset of Christianity. And it was the Adam and Eve diet, which is what veganism is known as now, right? No. That's that, hold on. The veganism diet is known as Adam and Eve? So it, so it was called the Adam and Eve diet, but it's basically what veganism is now, oh. right? So veganism is not a diet. It's, it's a more oh, a, I know why they say Adam and Eve, because they only ate the fruits and, you know, they didn't eat the animals back then. Maybe. But but what's so fascinating is that a, a young man at 12 years of age started working in the printing press where they were printing Bibles and stuff. John Harvey Kellogg. You might recognize the last name there, folks. Kellogg's Corn Flakes. And he was indoctrinated with this with this mindset of no no animal based and as he got older he was given the task of finding grain based alternatives for the bacon and eggs that every motherfucker would eat back in the day right because they're on the farm and they would butcher a pig and there's chickens around like no worries and is, it, is a pig ruminant no monogastric that means one and what pastured pork is awesome iberian pork like if it's free range organic that's amazing free range chickens amazing Buy the best you can afford is the thing. But what happened is that they were a very clean living uh, religion. So they didn't drink or party or do drugs. So they ascended the ranks of politics, financial, educational, and they've had a direct impact on the food pyramid that was designed. The food pyramid that, that says, eat all your heart healthy grains. There was at least two people uh, at the start of this, uh, start of the 19th century, the 20th century rather, that were key decision makers in what the rest of the the North America should eat, and of course everyone follows what North America does in the West, and so all of this ideology around beef causing climate change and causing heart disease, it's all bullshit, and you can go and easily find it out because it's like it's publicly available information. Why, why would it make sense to stop eating something we've been existing on for millions of years, you idiot? That's my two cents. Hey, you want to spend an hour a week with me helping you become a business badass? Well, check out my group in the link below. I just wish someone would know, would, would lay out the facts. But you know what I say? You know, look at the evidence. I always just, I always tell people, just look at the evidence. Like, for example, when I start eating just kind of, I, I call it paleo because there's some vegetables in there but just meat, basically, I feel great. My energy's up. Everything feels good. Like, you know, I, I get leaner. It's almost like that's what I'm designed to do. And then someone will come along and say, no, you're actually not designed for those. Or you'd have, you know, these long ass intestines, which you don't. That's why you do the, do, do, do. and it's like, man, so then you go back and forth and you're wondering, what's the truth? Because even doctors will tell you, and I know doctors, are taught what they're told, but are taught what they're told. Yeah. You know what I mean? 
They say, oh, no, too much red meat could cause this to increase and that to increase. But guess what? Go eat red meat for a year and do your blood work the whole time and see what it does. And what if it does? What if it does go up? Well, I've got 15 years of fucking blood work, right? I've been, I'm a real biohack with the stuff. I've been curious about my body forever. But you've been doing it for, you've been eating meat for how long? No, like since 2017, I went like a little bit paleo. And then in 2018, I went strict carnivore. Jordan I, Peterson went carnivore. Yeah, out of necessity, right? Same with his daughter, Michaela. Ma so if you was to say to me, Laban, what's the one thing that you had to pick out of adopting that style of eating? What's the one benefit you'd take? It'd be the mental health. Brad, I turned into a fucking beast. And in May 2018, when I was doing this, I went from running three miles, which is the furthest I'd ever run in my life, to running 26.2 miles two weeks later, right? I ran my first marathon, did it in three hours, 56. Eight weeks after that, I ran a 30 miler, which is 50 kilometers. And eight weeks after that, I completed the first of what has been three 60 mile ultra marathon trail runs. And what were you eating? Fucking mainly red meat. Like what kind? Beef. Beef is prolific in Australia. So steak you were eating? Lamb. I'll get it all bacon the, did, would it matter would it matter oysters. if it was fried deep uh barbecue sauce you well no i at that point i didn't i didn't you ate just the meat so it didn't no I was eating, nothing else uh ice cream it was my naughty little ice cream a little bit of chocolate like 99 percent of what i ate was animal based for three and a half years and and all your ales went away yeah and your energy went through the roof I got down to 8.4% body fat. I'm, I'm heavier than that now. But I I was running at sub three-hour marathon pace. Now, I'm not saying this to gloat, but like this is the miracle of, and I'm not saying you need to follow what I did. I, I, I want to be able to eat fruit and a few other things from time to time, but I ruined my metabolism by being a massive pisshead for all these years, throwing gear up my nose and up my bum. That's shelfing, by the way. You ever heard of that? Shelfing? It's when you put ecstasy up your bum. No. It's like what Sean Connery would say if he's shelfing. But why would you why would you put it up your bum? It intensifies the buzz. You never heard of this? No. Very popular. I've heard of somebody, you know, sticking alcohol in their ass and it gets them drunk quicker. Really? That seems like a lot of work. I go stuff a vodka bottle up your ass. <laughs> And you'll you'll get drunk faster, supposedly. I think the alcohol might be a byproduct. I mean, dude, I get drunk fast enough drinking it the normal way. Like, <laughs> yeah, I'm not putting anything in my ass. Like, you know, an ass is an exit. Yeah. All right, good. And what's funny is the other day someone told me a joke I thought was hilarious. Guy goes, <laughs> guy goes to the doctor and says, his asshole hurts. Guy says, what are you talking about? He says, you know, the asshole it hurts like crazy. He says, well, show me where. And he says, right here around the entrance. And the guy goes, that's not an entrance. <laughs> that's Do you the problem. Bomb dropping. Do you bomb dropping? He says, that's the problem. It's not going to stop hurting until you quit calling it an entrance. It's an exit. I got sidetracked from when I was about to crush in. You were talking about shelving. Yeah, but. Um, you, were, you were too busy putting shit in your ass. Yeah, like I destroyed my body and I would argue now that I'm in better shape than I've ever been. I'm 42, I'm 43 in June and I started this healing journey when I was 35. So it's never too late, folks. Like and I was never a runner, never a runner. I fucking hated it. And then I turned into this David Goggins beast. In July 2021, as an experiment, I ran a 30-mile run on zero sugar. I had a ribeye steak for breakfast, about probably a half a kilo, like a pound and a bit. And no A1 or nothing? What do you mean? You just no cooked A1. the steak oh, and sauce. It. Nah, nothing. I had half a gallon of homemade bone broth, which had like liver and spleen boiled into it as well, which you couldn't even taste. Nine slices of Jarlsberg cheese, which is like cheese from uh, Scotland, I think, or Sweden. And uh, 10,000 milligrams, which is about 10 teaspoons of sodium. And I didn't run it super fast. And I had a sports medicine guy monitoring me. And I had a continuous glucose monitor. But I did it completely and utterly fat adapted. 
not a not a bean of sugar. And most people would argue that what you did, Laban, is impossible. Well, I fucking just did it. So start start questioning what you are being told, and you will live a far more rewarding lifetime. They've been forgetting the bombs. There's the bombs. Casey was saying, hey, we better get a bunch of them. Lately, I haven't been pressing the bomb as, what, as much. You know why? Because the whole thing is a bomb. But do people do like the bombs? I want to start remembering the bombs. Keep going. You, you have dropped a whole bunch more than I've dropped, just so you know. Well, it was the thing is, Brad, this came from a place of being an inherently lazy son of a bitch, right? Like I, a lot of us are. Right? I wanted the shortest cut, and and I stumbled across it completely by accident. Well, there are no accidents, right? And And I was like, this is unbelievable. And not only do I feel fantastic, and here's the other byproduct for all the single lads out here, right? In 2018 is when I walked down the streets of Melbourne, bumped into my now wife, Anna, who's a smoking hot three-quarter Russian, one-quarter Japanese, legitimate belter, 10 out of 10, inside and out. And I went up to her with the confidence of a thousand Spartan warriors, Brad, and I said, excuse me, but you are stunning. And I wondered if you'd ever drink with me one time. You know what she said to me? She goes, you look good too. And that Russian twang, I can't even do anything close to it. But that came from this physical presence that I developed by getting absolutely fucking jacked. And people treat you better when you get in shape. You know this, right? I say it. People always want to get mad at me. I always tell people, look, you, you better looking people get more opportunities. Now, again, you can't control if you're ugly or good looking sometimes. But, like, you got a big old wart right here. Like, go get it removed. You know, you got messed up teeth. Go get them fixed. You, you're overweight. Work out. Try to look as good as you can because the truth is better looking people get more opportunity. Bingo. It's just the truth. Bingo. It's, it's a representation of the massive discipline that you have in your life as well, the more in shape you are. You don't need to have a big six-pack. Like, I got in great shape. It was it was miraculous. But it was because I had to eat what I had to eat because I'd, I'd done a lot of metabolic damage. Talk about like spiking your insulin and stuff. So now I You're don't- You're like a druggie. Yeah. You were doing ecstasy a lot? Yeah, yeah. But the, it was the the alcohol and the sugar and all the other stuff that, that I was pre-diabetic. And I had to go animal-based to keep the, keep the insulin levels- normal and that's when my body started to thrive so because what i'm trying to say is because of the damage that i did to my body i've had to be way more rigid and disciplined in terms of what i can eat now and if i go off the rails and have a bunch of ice cream and a bunch of sugar in whatever form it might be i pay the price you get good again i don't get good but i get well a couple of times i have if i've really gone for it right but i get joint pain right i get back pain i get like brain fog i can't cognitively be on top of things snoring right like i got snoring surgery in 2009 with a laser yeah, 1999 it was 2019 no 2009 sorry and uh the what the ent guy should have said again like the heartburn doctor hey you fat bastard Drop all the weight, knock all the froffies off, stop punching darts, and you'll stop snoring. They lasered out my uvula, so the punching bag in the back of your throat, they chop it out. They they drilled out my nasal passages, right? The pain is what I would liken if you gave a lightning bolt a blowjob. Just think about that for a second, people. That's some painful shit. And I was pissed because that's irreparable damage now. Like it's grown back somewhat, but that's totally preventable. It was about a $10,000 surgery. Like, hey, just cut the carbs and you stop snoring, you fat bastard. You know, what's funny too is again, I always say look at the results, but whenever I gain weight, like where I'm chunky, I snore. Whenever I start working out, getting in shape, I stop snoring. Like it's just, it's just look at the evidence. Stupid. It seems easy, but nobody seems to get it. And right now, there's going to be people going, dude, you can't just eat meat. What? 
apparently you can, but I would say if you don't believe it, eat meat for a little while and look at the results. Cause when I'm now mostly eating meat, I lean down, I get in shape. I, and people, well, your energy, my energy's fucking fine. You know, people say, you know, do a fasted cardio, you know, it'll burn more and it'll do this. It'll do that. Look, it doesn't really, to me, the evidence doesn't show that because I've got up and did fasted cardio and nothing really changed much. But when I got up and I uh, ate a, a, what I eat is hamburger and a couple of eggs because I like it, dude. Like to me, I can, I easily can eat this shit. I have no problem with it. It's a delicious. Eggs is animal products. Yeah. You say cheese is animal products? Yeah. Yeah. Some people can't tolerate dairy super well. So just well, here in America, and, that is. We'll try and get raw dairy, depending but, on where you live. But still, all the doctors in the world tell you, oh, you're just going to fuck you up. So listen to doctors or go do it and, and see what happens. Do the opposite of what the mainstream tells you to do. I now get my blood thing. checked every quarter. So now I'm going to do what you did. Well, I would encourage you and people that are listening that are 40 plus male, I think female as well, to get a CAC score done. A CAC score is a calcium artery score, calcium artery score or something. And it, what, it, what it does is it can tell, it's like the widow make a heart attack, which kills a lot of athletes. If you get this scan done, it's, it's a pretty cheap, really fast, non-invasive scan. It can tell to see whether you've got any calcified deposits in and around your ticker, your heart. And that might be something to be very conscious of, right? It won't pick up the soft plaque, but it will see whether you've got any calcification there. And if you can get onto something like that, I know people that are working with people to help reverse CAC scores, right? And this is where I Through think- Through what? Just meat and meat again? Well, it, it, look- there's a lot of different uh, alternatives, but like to me, dry fasting is this panacea. People that do a, a five day dry fast once a year, documented through a number of these studies, are getting 30 extra years of good health. 30 fucking years, Brad. What is that worth to you? And you, you talk you about trade this, five days for 30 right? years. You talk about this. And I'll get you to quote it because I don't want to. Oh, I don't want to paraphrase. When you talk about like the the discipline, you know, if you don't do the discipline, now the thing that you weren't disciplined becomes the thing that you sacrificed. Do you remember that quote? Mm -hmm. Do you remember this? Yes. Can you can you say it properly? It's so what you, if you don't sacrifice for what you want, what you want becomes a sacrifice. Amen, brother. Preach. Drop that bomb. Yeah. Well, that's a BL original. <laughs> you know, I saw a quote the other day on the internet that said that and then it said unknown and i'm like motherfucker that was me <laughs> it's crazy like you don't get rich making poor choices that's me i got a bunch of originals but they're all stemming from something like like there's one in my in my green room in there that says listen with your eyes and you'll see all you need to hear People are always like, hey, that's clever, you know, like that, but, yeah. but that's basically, you know, actions speak louder than words. It's the same thing. It's just my way of spinning it. So everything I've said that's original, I probably got from something. But point being is if you don't sacrifice for what you want, what you want becomes the sacrifice. So you're going to sacrifice either way. You might as well pick the right one and get what you want. It's worth it, kids. I promise you. It's like getting rich is hard. Being broke is hard. Isn't it's harder. It? Yeah, I would say it's harder. It's way harder. Yeah. So a lot of people are going to think, well, this is a health show. This was a this episode was on health, and it really isn't. You're you're a you, you teach people how to put to start podcasts, which we haven't even talked about. <laughs> what is what is podcastingheroes dot com? Well, like we sort of touched on, when I was talking about that experience with less. When you go through hundreds of these types of encounters with. People that you would know, you know, I've had 10% of all of the recognized Hall of Fame speakers that exist. There's only 250 of them, like people like General Schwarzkopf, and Les Brown and Jim Cathcart, this kind of thing. Patricia Fripp and Shep Hyken, like all these people that are on light speed. Like there's a gap in the market for people that are just starting out or have been doing their show for a while, whether it be a podcast or YouTube channel or Rumble, whatever you're doing where you want to get your message out there, and particularly with interview-style podcasts as well. 
And I would, I would encourage people, we need more people to step into their greatness. We need more people to be a voice. And we, don't need to, we don't need to change the world, but your contribution will create positive momentum for other people to be brave and to be courageous, right? And so, like you always talk about as well, like get advice from people that have already done it. Like you don't need to follow in the shitty footsteps of other people. Like get the shortcut. Get successful faster. It's all through your book as well, right? Like, so what I teach people how to do is is ten percent the mechanics around what you need to do. The Lucia.com, the language that you can use that will elicit the best outcomes. But when I was putting this course together, Brad, I realized ninety percent of it's fucking mindset. I can't give you Les Brown's number if you're not mentally ready to to handle that, right? And, and that's what I help people. I help them get from A to Z. And so we created this, this amazing movement and it's only just been going for a few months. It's been life-changing because what happens is once you develop these amazing relationships after time, and I'm three years, over three years deep into this now, some of these relationships are no like and trust level. And they're like, hey, Laban, come on my mega show, a.k.a fucking dropping bombs, right? Even though I don't have a big presence and and I can show people how to do it in a way that's going to be organic and in alignment with your core beliefs and values. And it is so unbelievably <coughs> fulfilling and rewarding when you get to lean into what your, your divine purpose is. I'm not a religious guy, Brad, but I'm very, very spiritual and I'm humble enough to know that I've got a huge army of angels looking after me in whatever capacity you want to think about that. And now that I'm doing this, because I was mediocre at everything my whole life, never played representative sport, failed fifth form twice. Now I'm fucking good at this. Maybe the best in the world. Certainly the world's best courage coach. Because I teach people how to take bold, massive, and courageous action so that they can facilitate their own miraculous outcomes. That's my little role in this little planet that we're spinning on. Or maybe it's flat. So if someone listens is like, dude, I want that, where do they go? Podcasting heroes? Go kick off, get the but free. But if they just want the courage? They don't want to do a podcast. Well, you can hire me for a massive fees for one-on-one -on -one stuff, but I don't have a lot of bandwidth for that. But there's plenty of content out there. A lot of these interviews, what, I'm, what I've been sharing today a lot of it's been from what i've acquired from these amazing interviews but when i'm hearing you know the podcasting thing you're teaching people how to start their own podcast how to get people on their guests so if you're a podcaster or you want to be a podcaster you should call you and what i'm thinking is everyone that's listening to this right now should have a podcast they're just afraid to for some reason or another or you know they don't understand the value of it which is crazy because when i was started this podcast someone told me dude there's a million podcasts now. You're a little late is what they said. And I said, yeah, I'm not really trying to be a big podcast. I'm, I, but my mission is to get the knowledge from the people who have it to the people who need it. So I'm just going to interview the people that are coming in my office to film their courses. And, you know, because Les Brown's, you know, Tony Robbins, you know, Zig Ziglar, John, Ma all the big names. They come in here once or twice doing their thing. And I'm like, why am I not, you know, picking their brain on on audio? And it. And for me, it was all audio. So I'm like, dude, let me just get a couple of microphones and, and, and say, hey, while you're here, why don't we just do a podcast real quick? And they'd say, yeah. So I started doing it. Next thing you know, boom, top 10 in the country. Next thing you know, boom, I, I, I'm going through airports. Hey, dude, Bradley. Hey, I fucking listen to your podcast. And all of a sudden, next thing you know, the podcast is huge. And it's not as huge as Joe Rogan. People always say, no, Joe Rogan. Motherfucker, that's a guy. That's, Who that's, says that's, that? That's beyond huge, Joe Rogan's. He's been doing it for 100 years, too. So, again, I think I'm the closest thing to Joe Rogan. Easily. And I'm not saying that to blow smoke up your date, either. Yeah, well, good. well again, I agree with you. But, but, you know, I think I think... I don't want to be the next Joe Rogan because I think Joe's Joe, but I'm me. And I think, I think the show is growing and it's growing rapidly. And I, and, and I wouldn't have done it if I listened to all the bullshit. Mm -hmm. I think everyone should have their own podcast, even if it doesn't end up huge, just for the sake of what you're talking about. You're able to get in the room with people because, dude, listen, people call me and say, will you be on my podcast? I don't know if you did. I think you did. Yeah. And I said, yes. Why? Well, because, dude, number one, it's not that difficult for me to do. 
Number two, I get to meet new people. You, you said you're considering putting your shit on light speed. It's like, okay, well, that wouldn't have happened if I didn't say yes to that podcast. So everybody listening, if you're offered to be on a podcast, I'd say yes. Every time. If, if you don't have your own podcast, just like if you don't have your own book, I'd say you need to write one and you need to make one. So you're the dude that shows them how to do it, teaches them pretty much how to get the guests, how to do everything. So if you're interested in making a podcast, you're smart. It'll make, it'll blow up your business. It'll do more than you think. It'll help build your personal brand. Then go to podcastingheroes.com. And by the way, heroes is H E R O E S. Most people just think it's an S because a lot of dumb dumbs out there. <laughs> and I want to say something as well for the folks at home. If you get benefit from this show, right? You re like you've been listening to it for a while. Like share this with someone you care about. Like the way that these shows create the most amount of positive impact is by you taking the time to click the share link and sending someone say, "Hey, this might be of interest," because that's how I learned about my healing journey, the Joe Rogan podcast. Like someone sent me a link, and it, and it's completely transformed my life forever. So do the needful. Take the two seconds and share it with someone you care about and then go and rate the motherfucker because the algorithm picks up that it's interesting and then, like, let's make this, let's blow this up. Let's Hiroshima this dropping bombs. Well, you know what I was told by a couple of experts that the because it's called dropping bombs, it's automatically flagged and suppressed in a lot of algorithms. And I'm like, should I change the name? To what? Dropping the, feathers? Getting real? Maybe. It could be it could be a fun experiment. But uh, look. Getting real with Brad Lee. Come on. The real Brad Lee. And dude, my whole brand now is real. Why? I, I made these shirts with a little rhino in the yard. They look cool as shit. It says real. Dude, everybody says, where do I get one of those shirts? So I start giving out the shirts to these influencer guys, these gurus. Next thing you know, they're they're out there in the public wearing this real shirt. And everyone's asking them, where do they get it? They're telling me. I'm like, dude, I can end up with a fucking clothing brand like this. But just real. Why? Why do people say, why real? Well, that's just my brand. Because I think, you know, number one, you got to be real nowadays. Number two, are you trying to make... You're, you're like, are you trying to chase your dreams or would you rather make them real? Which one would make you rather chase your dreams make or, them real. or make them real? Exactly. Like real is such a good word. Real. Like it's real. It's tangible. You can hold it. And I think people need to be real. I think men need to be real. A real man. Exactly. What is a real man? A real man ain't a cheating, lying piece of shit. Okay. You got ethics. You got integrity. You, you got your health, you know, real health. You know, real relationships. You want to make some real money? Like everything's real, I think, that's worth anything. So that's why I go with real. So get, these experts kept saying, dude, dropping bombs is why you're not already way bigger. And I'm like, really? You think so? And they're like, yep, the word dropping bombs and the algorithm is keeping it this and that. I'm like, damn, dude, it's such a good name. And then, and then I said, well, maybe I should change the name. They said, well, think of a good name and, you know, change it and see what happens. Well, I don't know if I should do that. I want to find out from the listeners, the bomb squad. Because, again, they wouldn't be the bomb squad anymore. They'd just be real people. The real squad. Or be the real, real people. I don't know. I think persistence beats resistance, right? Like, I think it'll it'll, it'll swing around and, and just keep keep doing what you're doing, Braden, and uh, let the law of momentum just kick its ass and then give it the big middle finger later on and say, I didn't change shit. Getting real with Brad Lee. Or dropping bombs. You guys decide. Hit me in the DMs. Go follow my man Laban Ditchburn here at LabanDitchburn.inc or go to podcastingheroes.com. Get some courage. Learn how to freaking draw people to your business. Anything else before we sign sign off? No, I might I I I keep the ecstasy out your bum. Yeah, just don't shelf pills. Nope. Uh no shelfing. But um all I would say is that. Don't take anything I say as blind gospel, right? Go and do the research. I have, I'm not joking, Brad. I've read more than 600 books in the last five years. My, all self-development or diet, no Harry Potter, right? Haven't even seen Harry Potter movies. No offense to any 
uh, Hogwarts people. But I've empowered myself with knowledge. And you, once you get to a level where you are just becoming a sponge, you, you start to develop a real intuitive sense for what's real and what's not. See what's what? What's real. Exactly. What's not. So that's my encouragement. Sending love and abundance. Have a great day if you're, if you're not having one. And if you are, we'll keep up the good work, would you? And as always, till next time, keep it real. At the end of the day, I can describe my jet that's coming. And by the way, it is coming. Exactly to a T because I've mapped out and visualized it every single day. Do you map out and visualize exactly what you want? If the answer is no, try it. I'm telling you, it does miracles. Map out and visualize what success looks like. Don't be one of those people that just say, I want to be rich. What's rich? I don't know. Just want to be rich.